At the media tour in San Francisco, I got the chance to interview Yoshi P for a second time, the first time actually being two years ago in San Francisco for the Stormblood media tour. It's always an amazing opportunity to speak with somebody I respect so much. I have so much love and admiration for a lot of the people that are part of the Final Fantasy XIV team. And that is due in you know large part to everything that I've learned about them uh, through no clips documentaries on the you know the fall and rise of Final Fantasy that series by uh, this by Speakers Network you know learning more about how somebody ticks allows you know allows you to form a stronger bond with them and if it wasn't if it was just FF14 being an amazing game, that would be one thing. But the fact that I am so tied to the community and I am so interested in the people who are behind it, whether you're talking about like the community team, uh, Yoshi P himself, uh, Soken san, you know, Susan Calloway, Uematsu, everybody that has anything to do with the game, it just endears it so much more. So it was a great privilege to interview Yoshi P again, and I actually got to do so. Uh, with a good friend who you probably know Larry Zor. So we were paired together and had a 145 interview with Yoshi P and his translator Aimi, who you've probably seen on the live letter and other live letters that she's translated for. We had 45 minutes and we were able to ask three questions each. And actually the way we're running these videos is that Larry will be reading his half of the questions and I'll be reading my half. We'll be linking each other's videos. So if you want the complete interview, you can either watch both our videos or just click on the link below in the description to see the full transcript. But what I'll do is uh, I will go through my questions and as I go through the questions, I will sort of inject my thoughts and what was going through my head as these things were being said and as these questions were asked. My questions, of course, were on user experience. I really wanted to come in with a sort of uh, a focus this time and because honestly, I feel like I needed to speak to my strengths. And my strengths are my my history in UI. Uh, I, I tried in the past to do videos on the different classes, but I just don't have the depth of knowledge that somebody like, say, Mr. Happy, Mary, and other people that I really respect in the community have, Ms. Tech, uh, Larry, Tate, etc. So I'm not I didn't want to try and do that. So I wanted to ask, at least get a foundational knowledge for myself, and hopefully you learn something new through this when it comes to how the how design works, how user experience works uh, for a game as large as Final Fantasy XIV. So without further ado, let's get this started. So my first question, greeting them. It was nice to see you again. Thank you for the opportunity. I interviewed you two years ago for Stormblood, and my focus has changed. I'll be focusing more on the user experience and your background there. So you've talked about the numerous user interface improvements in Shadowbringers, and you had the little and more text on the slide. Given the rigid timeline, especially having to release patches and work on the expansion, what percentage does the development team devote to UI improvements versus new content? And Yoshida replied, it's about the same for new content versus user interface. That's because we have a team dedicated to handling user interface. Obviously, that is pretty straightforward. So with our user interface team, we have four dedicated game planners and designers, uh, five artists who are dedicated to just working on the user interface. We have special programmers that work on the implementation of these UI elements, and there are five of them. So of course, the size of the team may be smaller than the teams who are working on battle content. But they do have the same development period because we have different teams working on those aspects. So in terms of how much time we're working on UI related items, it's exactly the same. So the nugget in that first part that I really latched onto was the actual number of people that work on the uh, on the design team and on the user interface team uh, on on 14. And you know, five, five, and four, we have 14 people that work on the team. And uh, not having that knowledge before, of course I could have probably just gone to the credits and like looked them up, but just to, just to hear it in that state, like he was very willing to kind of talk about that. So the UI team will typically have two major tasks for each work period for each patch. If there's any new content going into the game, they'll work on a dedicated UI associated with it. Or if there are any existing elements that require upgrades to the user interface, 
there's a major, a major task that the team would handle. For example, GPose and the user interface around group pose or anything that exists could, be, could use an improvement or update. That would be the major task of the UI team. So those two major tasks, they would look at how much is on their plate and sort of control and manage their workload, which makes absolute sense. And if they, they seem to have a good amount of autonomy uh, and uh, direction, so you know, being able to work on these things at least every three months, they could definitely have longer, longer sprints and, uh, and cycles to do these things. I'm thinking like the, the introduction of GPOs or the introduction of like the Glamour Dresser and a lot of the UI changes that they've done. Uh, I, I do wonder how much uh, technical debt that the UI team does have from 1.0, because uh, especially with the uh, 3.0 patches, the Heaven's Word patches, we started to really see uh, a lot more user improve, uh, user interface improvements and quality of life improvements when it came to like surfacing information. I still consider those things technical debt at some point because it's not something they could do from the get go. They had to sort of build into it or kind of dig themselves out of it. Uh, I didn't get a, a chance to ask him a question about technical debt, but at the same time, I don't think that's a really proper question to ask. It's like, how much debt do you have? Like, that's not really something that uh, I would want to be asked or would want to ask anybody. So if I ever find out a way to ask a question like that in a more, uh, in a more, in a kinder manner, I, I definitely will next time I see him. So my second question. So a lot of friends I introduce to the game are controller users. A good number of them are on the PS4 or they just prefer the controller experience in general. And they've always said that the game's controller experience is excellent. It's been said that because you, as in USGP, is a controller user, you've taken great care to make sure that this experience is top notch. How are your design decisions influenced by your own experience with the game? And I really wanted to use the term dog fooding, but I'm not really sure that's something that one could be translated effectively or in the way that I'm wanting it to be, or if it's just a word that's not really used in, uh, in, in Japanese culture. Uh, dog fooding, if you don't know, is the, the process of using your own product. That is something I really lived by when it came to Twitch, which is why I became a, a broadcaster myself. I, the first reason I became a broadcaster wasn't to get partner. It was to learn how to better build products for the people I was working for, uh, which were the users. And so I, I took a lot of, um, I, I hold that concept very high. At GitHub, it was the same way too. We would always use the products. We built GitHub by using GitHub. And GitHub is a, is a code hosting site, uh, if you've never heard of it before. And so I wanted to know from Yoshi P's standpoint, what kind of dog fooding he's done. And he answered the following. From a fundamental perspective, I've been playing MMORPGs for 25 years since Ultima Online, so 22 years. So I've been a very heavy and avid gamer in general. Of course, with MMORPGs, naturally you'd be playing with a mouse and keyboard, but at the same time, growing up in Japan and playing a lot of console games, you'd be using a controller as well. With that career experience, when we're tasked with re-releasing, when we were tasked with re-releasing Final Fantasy XIV, we wanted it to be on both PC and PS3, making sure we were bringing it to both platforms. Plus, since was, this was going to be an RPG in the Final Fantasy franchise, you have to have controller support. We don't want to exclude any con console players because this is an MMORPG, but at the same time, because this is an MMORPG, it would be pointless not to have mouse and keyboard support either. So from the initial concept, we wanted to make sure we could play comfortably on both mouse and keyboard, as well as controller, and that makes a lot of sense. And I think that, you know, having a, having the distinct, like the unique position of being an MMORPG, uh, of building a PC game piece, a PC game type in a, in a, in a land where your namesake is on console, it, it can, it actually can be a pretty daunting task. I mean, they could have very well just you know, uh, done a menu system much like Final Fantasy XI's or just kind of, um, just kind of harken back to any other, or just done, just done a mouse and keyboard. But he goes on to say, so once that concept of making it accessible to both control schemes was in place, the very first thing I thought about was the how the mouse functioned. So the mouse is of course a very direct interface where you can click on a target, click on your hotbar, 
to execute actions. But on the flip side, the controller, you can do simple actions with the, bu with the buttons that are available. But if you wanted to target something and try to execute an action with just one button, there are a limited number of buttons on the controller, of course. You'd still need to control your character, you'd still need to toggle through the different pages on your hotbar. It's clunky, and that extra step of selecting whom will do what adds to the hassle of playing on, con on a controller. And this sort of reminds me of some of the other MMOs I've played, that you know some have either taken a lot of inspiration from Final Fantasy XIV, or they've tried their own way. I, I think of Terra, and you know Terra had a very very good battle system, and I think if you talk to most people that talk about Terra, they're going to talk about Terra in the sense of battle system rather than the story. And I didn't, I didn't play past like level fifty three because I didn't really realize know what I was doing. But that's a that's neither here nor there. I preferred playing on keyboard though because the controller support was a little was a little clunky. And it didn't feel as smooth as, as 14s, especially after I started playing 14 and started learning the controller, because uh, I was definitely a keyboard user first. So Yoshida goes on to say, that's when I came up with the idea of the cross hotbar. When you're using your trigger buttons to bring up a page where you can assign additional actions to the same buttons, kind of like a shift key modifier. It would feel just as smooth to execute actions as it would be to click them with a mouse. So as far as my that's so that's as far as my idea went. Then I consulted my UI specialist Hiroshi Minagawa. I told him this is the idea I have for wanting to make it hot bars accessible for mouse and keyboard and controller. Could you help me find ways to make it so there's no difference in the gameplay experience? And I was really excited that he said his UI specialist is was Hiroshi Minigawa because I had not known that myself and sure again you could probably look at the credits for this stuff but again hearing it from him and hearing an anecdote means so much more to me than just kind of like scouring names and in the, in the credits to see who's on the UI team so I really liked that the team kept that spirit and concept even until now we continue to make sure that there's no disparity in the player experience between using a mouse and keyboard or a controller it's thanks to the UI team that we brought up earlier of course, the initial direction and ideas for how to make it accessible were mine, but I had help from my team. I just think they did a wonderful job, and I believe that leads to a good player experience. I went on to ask because one of the big changes that I really liked uh, way back uh, when I started playing was the introduction of the W, or I believe double, uh, cross hotbar. And I asked, was the W cross hotbar your idea or the UI team's idea? And uh, Yoshi P replies, the WXHB, the W cross hop bar, was Minagawa's idea. And he went on to say he's almost perverse in how he comes up with things. He's crazy good. So, you know, thank you, Minagawa, for everything you've done. I, I really like just getting a, a sense of like, you know, that, that Yoshi P does, does think from a very high level and he even speaks from a from a lower level too. I, I really was kind of um, not knowing too much about game development when I came into actually interviewing uh, interviewing directors like Yoshi P. I didn't know what you know what role a director usually takes like how into like the low level programming is said director. And I know that when I interviewed Yoshi P two years ago, that his his knowledge of engineering and his knowledge to be able to answer questions about like that's not that's not possible from an engineering standpoint or that's not possible from a uh from a design standpoint. I don't know, it's a really good it's a, it's a really good uh mark of a director, somebody that's in his position. I mean he's producer director technically, but like it really I was really impressed when I would be, read interviews uh, with Yoshi P and see like the approaches he would take and the care he would take to be able to explain if something was was not possible in one way or another, and if stuff were actually possible. Like this shows that you know cre the creation of the cross hotbar, which has been so popular uh, that other games started emulating it, uh, is you know to know that was his idea was was. It was really cool and really, really good to know. It was great, great learning experience. My last question with Yoshi P was uh, building off of one of Larry's questions. And, and Larry, of course, being a summoner main, uh, asked about uh, some of the new summoner uh, 
some of the some information around Summoner. So building off of one of Larry's questions, seeing the removal of pet actions uh, was surprising, or rather, not really the removal of pet actions, but the reassignment of pet actions from the pet toolbar to becoming a player action. But it makes sense from a simplification standpoint. And that's something you did when you revised the battle system back in 4.0. How do you balance the task of simplifying actions while keeping the skill ceiling high? My question was worded a little bit weirdly, and, I, and he did ask for some clarification as to what I meant. And I did uh, kind of land on the um, land on the term, you know, a concept of easy to learn, hard to master, because they're consistently trying to make uh, things simpler which can be convoluted as, you know, being uh, being simple and plain. And I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll get into the answer because he, he actually does address it. And thank you to Aimee again for, uh, for being able to translate um, my idioms so well. With any job mechanic in general, we look at it as simple versus complex isn't necessarily the same as fun or not fun or interesting or not interesting. It's a different comparison. Some people are under the impression that if something is simple, then it's boring or plain. That doesn't equate in my mind. It's nonsense. It doesn't make sense. And he was actually a bit, a bit heated. I was, you know, I kind of sat back in my chair a little bit because like, oh, like, oh, I didn't expect, you know, this to kind of, to, I didn't expect this passion to come out, but I was all the more glad to see it. With trying to make it so that the player finds it interesting or fun to handle or manage, it's only achievable after they've understood the mechanics behind it and the rules that are associated with it. They can then make the decision on whether or not it's fun. For example, with some of the job concepts, we think about what concepts would allow for players to think, okay, what do I do to raise my DPS? Then understand that basic rule and then figure out from there, oh, this is really cool or interesting, or maybe this isn't my cup of tea. Having that rule set available for them to understand and then connect it to making their decision on uh, whether or not they find it interesting. So having that basis uh, to be able to make that decision. And they, it kind of feels like they just want to step out of the way. They want you to find your own enjoyment with the game. They don't want the, the controls to be uh, what's enjoyable about it. Yes, they can be, you know, it's like good design isn't noticed. Like you're using something that's well designed. It doesn't mean that like you're... You know, you're not, sometimes you just forget you're using something because it just works so well. You, you're not thinking about the way you interface. You're thinking about what you'll be able to do with that, that instrument or that piece of equipment or that controller or keyboard or other instrument, a, you know, something as simple as a pen. So with all the jobs we've adjusted in Shadowbringers, we wanted to identify the elements that have become very complex and make it hard to grasp what the job is supposed to do and simplify it. So the players could get a better understanding of what the concept of each of these jobs are. So we have that concept. And on a separate axis, we identify whether or not the interface is complex, going back to the question about button inputs. That's where it ties into the conversation, where once we have that mechanic, we have the concept of what a job is, and we have that ideal form of a simple mechanic. Now we look at the interface. If the input buttons are all over the place, or they're too many to handle, then it becomes a very bad player experience that would cause stress. That's when we think about how many button, op, uh, button inputs would be optimal. Again, makes sense. Establish the problem, create a elegant solution for it, or at least a simple solution. It doesn't have to be elegant. Sometimes when you're trying to be clever, things can get a little convoluted. Uh, and I've, I know I've done that. I'm guilty of that in the past, of being too clever with a, sort of UI, with a piece of UI and then having support come back to me and saying, people don't know how to use this. And I'm like, well, look, it's easy. It's because you did that because I designed it but you can't expect the player to do that. And it's not because of the fact that, you know, people say like you design for the lowest common denominator. It's like, no, you, 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 tr you design for, you design at a base level and you on, and in your onboarding, you're able to teach, it's like teaching them how to fish rather than like giving it to them. You want to make them love what they're doing with your software, with your website, with whatever you're building, so then they can take it and do whatever they want to from there. Amongst the dev team members, we do have an average number of input buttons for each of the different jobs. We always try to strive to keep that average number, uh, to try to keep that average number so it doesn't become too stressful. That's when we start reviewing the different actions that are available in your skill set. 
Do we want to remove some of the actions because it gets too complex? Do we need these actions to be associated with each other? Does it make sense? Is this action really being used? Those are the kind of questions we ask ourselves to see how we can optimize the controls and make them comfortable. I really liked hearing that they have an average number of buttons. And that's kind of something I've always assumed they have, like especially with the controller, it's very easy for us to assume that that action bloat will sort of never really become a problem. And that's the kind of the whole basis of my question in the first place is that the fact is, is that if, if, if controller bloat is something that they're trying to fight with every expansion, then that means that that skills and stuff have to get squished or removed or changed in some way to keep that number. And, but it's nice to get confirmation that they actually do have an average number per class of buttons that you can, um, that you can press for any given job. So you can kind of look like, you know, look at a ninja, look at any class, a tank or a healer, see how many actions they have plus role actions, and then kind of, you know, see that number over time. And you can kind of get a sense of like, you know, how much they'll add or how much they'll subtract, you know, extrapolate that going forward. And, you know, given the fact that they do have these sort of, um, these, these caps, these averages that they like to stay to, you can kind of reliably predict, you know, whether or not this stuff is going to happen. And I think as we go into 6.0 and beyond that, you know, there always, there's always going to be a, a battle system maintenance, uh, like they named it for, for Shadowbringers. There's always going to be that, that sort of like, okay, it's been two years. Let's look at everything over again. Let's add some new cool things and let's make the interface a little bit easier for you to use. And uh, for that, I really recommend uh, looking at Larry's question on uh, on the identity of Summoner because that's a, it's a really great one when it comes to progression. To finish up the answer, there's a sweet spot with regards to having a comfortable amount of inputs whenever a gamer is playing a game. We feel that it's our responsibility and our job to make sure we're managing the number of actions. So we make sure the mechanics are easy to understand, make sure the interface is comfortable, and then make decisions around which actions need to be modified. Again, it makes sense and it really shows with what they've done. You know, you kind of think of, and I mean, just because they, they're able to do things doesn't mean they're always doing them right. And it's up to us as the player base to be able to hold them accountable and hold them to what we feel our optimal, uh, our optimal play is. And I think we've done that. I think we've been doing a good job of that. Some better than others, some worse than others. There are some tactics that are better to use when it comes to talking to devs. And you know, you can really kind of get a sense of where they're coming from, of where they have their ideas. And then, you know, as those ideas come out, they're tested against a user base. You know, I can I can look back at all the products I've designed throughout my years at Facebook, at GitHub, at WordPress, and Twitch, that we had a a grand design or a research design, no matter how much user research you do, you still are gonna get those edge cases. You're still gonna find those pain points that you didn't see beforehand. And I think it's really important, at least with you know the videos that I want to do in the future, uh, if you know if if I could if I can earn your view for them. One of the points I really like to drive home is the, is trying to gain empathy amongst a user base, in that like. It, the more empathy that you have for the dev team, the more you're able to kind of see their decisions and be able to communicate better with them in order to make your experience better. Because like, you know, you can shout at the cloud, like the, old, like the Simpsons mean. You could be the old man shouting at the cloud, or you can be, you know, an empathetic user who knows how to talk to a dev, give them good, good feedback and trust in them to make sure they're looking out for you. And, you know, I think that the 14 dev team, the people behind 14, the, the community team, you know, throughout the almost six years that I've been playing this game, and I can't believe it's, you know, it's already been that long for me. They've proven again and again that they're willing to do that, that they're willing to, to change their thoughts on things. And they're willing to admit mistake, to admit fault, like I, I, uh, in Larry's questioning, we heard that, you know, there, the, the word regret was used when it came to Arcanist and how Summoner and Scholar like were built off of that. 
if they could go back and do it, they would do it differently, but they wouldn't have had that experience without having gone through that in the first place. And now that, you know, they're just slowly starting to separate them. And you can kind of see that happening with the skill, the different skills. And uh, you'll see, I obviously see so much more in the, uh, in the media tour videos coming out of my colleagues who also went to the media tour. So that's kind of where I stand with this. And I, and again, this is sort of a bait. This is not like, these are not the hot questions that you've always wanted to ask them, but these are definitely questions that I wanted to get out to establish a baseline so that when I go see them again, I can ask them more pointed questions when it comes to UI and specific pieces of UI. And equally, I can learn from you, you know, my, you, the people watching and the people who play this game on a daily basis, what you guys would want me to ask uh, because I am only as knowledgeable as the as the education I receive. So I really hope through this and through continuing to stream uh, 14 on Twitch that I can, with this focus, learn and further learn how to um, how to ask the right questions because that's so important. And then we can start getting better answers and we can start getting um, better answers to better questions and create this feedback loop that will really put a light on you know, how good we have it as 14 players when it comes to user interface and how much better we can make it if we try to. That's it for this video. I know I got on a couple of tangents, but I think that the, the interview was more of a, was definitely a basis for what I wanna talk about when it comes to Final Fantasy 14. And I hope you look forward to everything else, all the content we have here to offer when it comes to regarding the user experience of Final Fantasy XIV. This was a great video to make. I can't wait to see you at the next one. But until then.